I went back to circle my dad was county assessor and went to school the rest of seventh, eighth grade and high school in circle. Do you ever see any of the people or have you ever kept in touch with any of the people that you're in at the Arkansas? No, no. Oh, I, uh, I've seen a few, but not very many. No, not very, very few. What was the... Did, when, when, did your whole family then get back together again? Did all no, kids? no, never have. No, my dad didn't get married until after, in World War II, 17 years after my mother, 17 years after my mother was dead. So we were all, all growing by the time he remarried. So no, we never did we get, get together again. What was, uh, what was life like in, in those orphans? Oh, it was, it was not, it was good. There was no complaint. Uh, it was just a different type of life, but, uh, no mother or father, but the nuns to take care of you, and uh, discipline was, it was a lot different than a home. It was just, it was good, but it was a lot different than home life. So then, I was work for MDU, and I worked for them 33 years, and retired in 1979. And retired uh, 11, 11 years in September. Uh, well, I was, my years here in Wolfman, I was on the city council, Four years while I was on the council, we built the water treatment plant down the south edge of town. And they've been fighting for many, many years since World War II to get the railroad crossing open at, at uh, 6th Avenue. Because uh, we had just one egress from the north to south side to the underpass. Floods couldn't get up there. So we got the railroad to agree to open the 6th Avenue crossing. Well, Dad came here in 1916 from Halstead, Minnesota. And he went to work for, in the, his, his brother had a hardware store here. He went to work for him and then, oh, I don't know what year he started. I think it was Be the year Betty was born that he went to work on the highway. Yeah, he'd been on the highway, yeah. yeah that was, he worked down there in, for 30, 33 years. And uh, done everything, done everything on the highway. Six boys and one girl. Yeah, there was six boys and one girl. Now there's two boys and one girl. Maisie ended this, you know. Of course, we were tougher than the rest of them. Maybe we were 72. <laughs> oh. Well, we went from here, well, we were mobilized in Don Culbertson on September 16th, 1940. And we went out to uh, Fort Lewis, lived in tents for, oh, a good, good year, I guess. And then they finally got some barracks built for us. So we did. We did a lot of training there, and then we got a bunch of recruits, so they made us a cadre, and we had to teach them guys. And then on, you see, it was March of 42, we shipped out. March 17th, we left there. Some of them already had their, had spent their year in there. They were supposed to spend a year there, and then get out. Hmm. A couple of them, his best friend had his, his uh, Discharge. His discharge papers already when the war was declared. Did he keep them anyway? Uh, yeah, they kept him. Well, there was, there was two or three of them that had to, had to stay. But we went over to Australia and we trained there for quite a while. And I don't remember just, I think it was in, uh, we were on the boat going up to New Guinea on, on Christmas, Christmas Day, I know. So that had to be in 40, 40, yeah, 43. And then we went from from there to from New Guinea. We hop on the islands, and I left I left the outfit in uh, on rotation in from Bayak Island. Come home, took me three months to get here. But uh, the rest of the outfit they went all the way to Japan. Oh, did they? Yeah. I didn't have to go because I had enough points. <laughs> he did too. You know, really. He, 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 he got knocked off two boats before he finally got on one to come home because... I should have been home for Thanksgiving, but I made it New Year's, New Year's Day. What were you doing for three months while you were getting home? Why, what? I was, uh, we was in the camp in, uh, in Hollandia, New Guinea, just waiting for, the, waiting for these boats to come pick us up. Oh, one thing that really happened there that people should know about. 
we was there for Thanksgiving. And about a week before Thanksgiving, of course, there's no refrigeration at all. And it's in the jungle. They shipped us frozen turkeys and frozen hind quarters of beef, beautiful meat. And we've been living out of cans, you know. So what do they do to keep that stuff until Thanksgiving? It was all rotten. <laughs> Just try, and then he tried to serve it. Well, I saw that stuff sitting there, and I wouldn't touch it with a 10-foot pole. And so when I went through, went through the line, I says, I'll have some of those potatoes. And, and then I saw a sack of onions, just dry onions. I said, can I have one of them? Sure. That was my Thanksgiving. Boy, we, we did uh, kind of appropriate some uh, officer supplies once, too. We got, they, they were baking bread, so we got, we got all the bread we wanted. But we, uh, we were unloading a boat at night, and we saw some crates about this long, and they were steaks. So we had steaks. The officers were short a little bit, but we, we enjoyed them. <laughs> we put three fish first, and this, this guy come out, we had a farm, we took over the farm, and let him go to the neighbors, you know? And then this, this the guy said, well, let me help you, Arnie. I said, okay. And he hit the pig in the head with a hammer and just squealed. And I said, get out of there. So we had to hit him hard, you know, and then cut him. <laughs> and we just skinned him out, left the, hide, the fat on the hide. And this, here comes a German. Who in the world's in charge here, you know? And that kid over there, it's a colonel. And the kid, he was a private, you know? <laughs> German just chewed him out. And he did, and we threw all the stuff underneath the hay, see, but he cut, got it all up the head and, the, you know, they use everything. Everything. They don't waste nothing. Nothing German. Well, I don't think anybody in Europe wastes anything. You know, they, you know, they'll use every darn thing. So the next time we butchered the beef, and then we got in trouble. It was a nice one. And, our, of course, our government had to pay dearly, but it was sure. good. It was good. But they have a, a reunion every single year somewhere in the state, or in the United States, and it takes care of their replacements and everything throughout the time they were gone. And they, we have 500 people at that one in Kalispell. 500? 500 of the guys were there, plus yeah. their women. When we first went over, we were, went over, we were too early. <laughs> they weren't ready for us, so they farmed us out to a field hospital. And, um, then we got our, I was with the 132nd Evacuation Hospital, and uh, so we got them after the field. We got what didn't need immediate attention, and by the time we'd get them, like, we'd do our own boys first, and then the German prisoners afterward, and some of them were pretty, pretty stinky. So I think you got to learn to be strong, you know. For going there. One thing that the Germans always found out how to say was nix. <laughs> okay. <laughs> They'd say, you know, if you'd ask them how they felt, nix okay, you know, <laughs> nix okay. They found out how to say okay really quick. Let's see. Like I was saying, they, we, I didn't see too many people from Montana. They, uh, they were there but I just didn't see them. And uh, uh, I was always teased about it a great deal from Montana, you know. And uh, I don't think I'd ever seen a sheep in my life. <laughs> what can I tell you? Oh, that was... There were great people that we worked with. Played a lot of cribbage and and other cards when we were waiting for patients to come in. Some on night duty. I learned to. That's where I got started doing anesthesia. I learned to to do that after I got over there, which is typical army. You know, you hurry up and wait, and you aren't prepared for what they dish out to you. Were you? Uh, I mean, because you were going with that army that was on the move, backwards and forwards and forwards. Mm -hmm. uh, was it really constant? I mean, for a long time you just were... No, I, 
busy or uh, you mean the moving yeah, I mean well the moving and the, and the, and the uh, you know having to no I don't think we I think because we were the second ones back we didn't have to move as much I think that uh, we moved enough we were always transported in trucks you know. sometimes it was pretty messy it was rainy cold at Christmas time, we were housed in a, I think it must have been an old castle in, would it be Luxembourg that's up there, that little country that's up there in that, some little country anyway. We were in this castle, I know we were making uh, ice cream out of snow and <laughs> stuff. I met my wife. Funny was when I first came back in World War II, working for Vern Holland, and I got notice from the Selective Service Department that I have to sign up for the draft. And I said, I'm not signing up for any draft, I've just had it. <laughs> and uh, she said, well, you better go down and see George Dominowski. He's a Selective Service clerk. And so I went in there and I promptly told her that I was not signing up for any draft. I've just spent six years in this. I said, and I'm not going to sign up for any draft. She says, you have to, that's the law. And so I went up and talked to Judge Hogan. He says, yeah, I guess you'll have to sign up for the draft. And that's where I met her. And we set a wedding date for December the 29th of 1950. We had set that even before, I left, really before I got called back into the service. On Christmas Day of 1950, the Chinese apparently crossed the Eula River and every military leave, anybody, uh, everybody was called back to the post. You couldn't leave. There was a sort of a crisis. And I went in and I told General Hayden, I was his secretary, and I said, yeah, General, you know, I'm going to go AWL. I'd rather face a general court martial than face my fiance because she sent out all these invitations. And, he says, well, Cal, don't forget, don't worry about it. He says, I'm going to give you a pass. You go in civilian clothes. Nobody will know you're in a service. And, but you get back as fast as you can. So I got on the plane and flew to Helena. And from Helena, I drove home. And we got married on December 29th. And I was back in the office on January 2nd. And my wife became the court reporter. At that time, before we were married, she was working for the Farmers Home Administration in Helena. And when I left and got married, but then she got to be Judge Knight, the secretary of court reporter. He died in February of 1952. And Jack Locke from Wolf Point, who I'd gone to high school with in Huntington in the 30s, was appointed judge for Judge Governor Bonner. And so I became his court reporter for 17 years. And he died in June or early June or late May of 1969. And then on August the 1st of 1969, Judge Sordi was appointed and I worked for him until I retired. My grandfather, John Lister, homesteaded in the valley here, south of the river in 1908. Two sisters accompanied him as he came out from Tioga, North Dakota, and they also homesteaded at the same time. The reservation opened up to homestead in 1910, and that's when my grandfather came across the river and uh, established his business here in Wolf Point. Where my office stands and where this picture is being taken, he had a lumber yard on this lot. And if I'm not mistaken, that's the first deeded land in this township. And I have the original patent to this land, which was signed by Howard Taft. And that land has gone directly from my grandfather to me through my father. The abstract is very short. John Listrude was a, an enterprising man. And uh, besides the first lumber yard, 
he started, he built the first elevator, grain elevator. He built the first flour mill. He built the first electric light plant and operated it here in Wolf Point for a number of years. In addition, he was on the uh, board of directors of the original First State Bank, but he had to, as I understand it, had to leave the bank when he borrowed the money to uh, uh, start the electric light plant. But anyway, all of that, <coughs> as it may seem, he was a, uh, a wonderful old gentleman, and I remember him when I was in grade school when he would come back from his home in uh, Southern California to spend the summer with us at our home here in Wolf Point. As a child, I remember him, he was, because when my brother and I would get a licking, he would see to it that he got us downtown so that we bought a lollipop to help uh, <laughs> assuage some of the pain. <laughs> uh, he lived until 1936 when he died of a, of a stroke. We had some tragedy in our family, and my, in that my brother uh, broke his neck diving in the river uh, just a few weeks after he had graduated from high school. He was a quadriplegic, and he lived 17 years, which was an unusual time for quadriplegics to live in those times, but it was all due to the tender, loving care of my mother and father who devoted the rest of their life, you might say, as long as he lived, taking care of him. Uh, and it was one of the reasons that I came back to Wolf Point uh, to practice. Uh, I'm a board certified surgeon and usually people who have been trained like I have don't come to little towns like Wolf Point. But because of the attraction of being near my family during their time of trial, and also because there was, certainly was a need in this area for a, a surgeon, I uh, have never regretted my uh, choice. And so that uh, on a personal side and from a professional side, I have been very happy with my practice. And what? although lots of people are asking me uh, when I'm going to retire, I'm not thinking about retirement at this time. A fellow by the name of Joe Clark, and I'd worked for him, car, some carpenter work in Big Barn, and he was coming out here to Homestead. And I don't know, he got to talking to me, and I, I was going to come with him, and then I figured I'd go on to Alaska. Of course, I was going to run away from home, you know, run away leave. My dad didn't want me to leave. Well, some way or another, Joe said he's going home. Why don't you go up and homestead? Well, I couldn't homestead because I wasn't old enough. I was only about 17 then, 16, yeah, about 17. So Joe said, well, you go. To, my dad should homestead, so he'd come out and be homesteaded. That's how I got out here. Just an accident, I guess. What got you playing ball? Well, I was that's what I was doing there. That was I'd rather do that than eat down there when I was in Minnesota. But then after my see my dad died in 60, 1960, and I left uh, a kid of seven of us, six, uh, five boys and a girl, and I was the oldest. Well, I bought these young kids. I except the two babies, Paul and uh, Paul and Margie. My uncles took them. We were kind of a orphan orphan deal, you know. We had a farm in Minnesota and all that, but I had some uncles, and they didn't think I could do anything, so I had Uncle Bill, uh, he's the youngest, he never was married, he's, he was, uh, had a homestead down here in uh, Belfield, North Dakota. He was a, whore, a horseman, horses was all his, and he was a good one, too. <laughs> and. Uh, this Flint and Wraith are the one that started the First State Bank or the bank that's going now, you know. The Western. They were from Belfield. They were two clerks in the, in the Dickinson, or, uh, yeah, Dickinson Bank. 
they were just two Turks. But anyhow, this this new town, and they came, I don't know, they got wind of this, and they come up here, and they got, uh, that was in 13, I guess it was, some, sometime in 13. There was nothing there, hardly a town. It was all down at, at Old Town. So they got this Cogswell. He was a, uh, had that store and stuff at Old Town and uh, Shipstead, Henry Shipstead. And they put up $10,000, and that's what they started this bank with. They didn't have any money, these two guys. They were two young guys. All they could do is, well, they knew how a bank worked, I guess, and all that. But you couldn't start a bank now for ten hundred thousand. But that's the way it started anyhow. We went out there when I landed in Montana that spring in nineteen seventeen. We left at the first of April in Minneapolis and we got out here the seventh of April. We were seven days coming from Minneapolis out here. Stop and shoot ducks in North Dakota. <laughs> Oh, anyhow, I got out here, and Joe Clark and uh, Nate, my brother, he ran off and left the mine out. He was, they were waiting at the depot, and it was cold and snowy and rainy, and the, the streets of Wolf White, they, you would go down with the wagon. There wasn't no cars here then. The wagon would sink down in the mud, gumbo that deep, it was just big ruts. <laughs> you, uh... Well, that's how I kind of got to Montana. It was more of an accident. There's then, then we had the. Is that what for me? No. Well, uh, we went out there when I landed in Montana that spring of 1917. We left the, the first of April in Minneapolis, and we got out here the seventh of April. We were seven days coming from Minneapolis, our here. Stop and shoot ducks in North Dakota. <laughs> oh. Anyhow, I got out here, and Joe Clark and uh, Nate, my brother, he ran off and left the mine out. He was—they were waiting at the depot, and it was cold and snowy and rainy, and the, the streets of Wolf Point. They, you would go down with the wagon. There wasn't no cars here then. The wagon would sink down in the mud, gumbo that deep. It was just big ruts. I was born in Wolf Point in my uh, grandparents' home, which was the original Wolf Point site on, near the river. And um, he was a, a blacksmith here. He came in 1897 and then returned in 1922. So uh, he was, their house then was right next door to Dr. Huber's house. So anyway, I was born there, and uh, I can remember so well uh, the, the well the layout of uh, the original Wolf Point, and uh, of course, being the uh, blacksmith there in Wolf Point, in the original Wolf Point, he uh, also started the first water system that that original town site had. He had um, water that was piped from uh, their place and also uh, to the Cogswell trading store at first and then later their Cogswell store. And then uh, Cogswell, Sherman Cogswell and his sister, Alma Cogswell, uh, he had the water pipe there. And then there were several uh, businesses. There was the patent store and um, Chase had uh, the sub-agency. So uh, various business places in that area had running water. It was pumped from um, the, uh, they called it the water tower. But anyway, the first really water system, my grandfather, Joseph Pipel Sr., installed that. Now, now you mentioned the patent, patent office, okay? The patent, patent store. Store. It was a store, a general merchandise. That was the name of the store. Mm -hmm. They just called it patents when you needed to buy certain uh, um, whatever you had on your shopping list. You went to patents to get that store, to get that. And of course, Sherman Cogswell's store was, uh, it started out as a 
more as a training post. And um, when Sherman Cogswell came, first came from Michigan, uh, he taught school. It was an Indian day school for one term. And then he was the chief clerk in the, uh, the grocery store. It was, a, it was called the power, power store, and it was mainly a grocery store. Is that the same power that then went, is it Fort Benton or? No, no, it, his name was Power, Mr. Power. And he had, I don't remember his initials. But anyway, uh, Sherman Coxwell was his chief clerk. And then eventually, Sherman bought that store. And it was a, more of a, a trading post. It was a log store. Then when he uh, expanded, he had his own store. Sherman Cogswell store, which now is presently the uh, Herald News office. So um, that it started him in business. And then, of course, um, getting back to my grandfather, he, uh, when the homesteaders and the young, young persons would come to Wolf Point and were looking for some place to stay, of course, there was no, uh, there were no motels. There was a boarding house. Uh, William Smith had a boarding house, and when that was full, where do you go next? Well, in 19, way back in, in the early 1900s, Erickson had a hotel, a hotel, and they served meals there. And so uh, several, this one in particular that I, I visited with, Jim Terry was telling me when he first came to Wolf Point. And he said there was no place to stay. He asked Sherman Coswell, well, what, what am I going to do? Where am I going to stay? And they said, you go see Joe Pipel. And so uh, uh, Mr. Terry was telling me, well, I went to see Joseph Pipel, and he said, well, we'll go on and ask the missus, you know. And she said, he said, when we come in there, Mrs. Pipel said, you know, Joseph, he's somebody's boy. He'll stay with us. <laughs> hey, well, you know, you were asking me about that bridge. And uh, that was uh, in July 9th of 1930. They, um, they selected me to dedicate the br uh, christen the bridge because they, they said that I have the, um, uh, the blood of the... Uh, of the white and the Indian races. Mm -hmm. And because my, my father was born in Texas and uh, came up from Texas and settled in Wyoming and, and then moved on into Wolf Point. And then my mother was half Indian and uh, her father was a full blood German uh, that came out from Pennsylvania and married her mother who was a full blood Indian. So I was half and half. So, so what tribe was that then? The Assiniboine. Oh, was he yes. uh, my, my mother's uh -huh. mother, uh -huh. my grandmother, uh -huh. she was the Assiniboine. So that's why they chose me then. Uh, so they said I was a true daughter of the West because my mother was born and raised here on Wolf Creek. Uh -huh. And uh, then uh, uh, before my, and uh, we all lived on Wolf Creek right up above where Manny lives. Uh -huh. and. Um, they were all born there except my two younger brothers. They were born in Wolf Point. Um, my name is Lawrence Weston. I'm the tribal chairman of the Port Peck Assiniboine and Sioux Tribe. I am an Assiniboine, a resident of Oswego. My family is historically from the Oswego and Wolf Point area. The centenary or the Jubilee celebration of the 75th anniversary of the city of Wolf Point, uh, I guess, is a is an event that the tribe should not overlook because Wolf Point has played a significant role in the history of the tribe historically. Because at one time, you know, the city of Wolf Point come out of a trading post and a, uh, that was set up to deliver annuities and there was government operations, etc. there at Wolf Point for the Cenoboid people uh, on the west end of the reservation. 
And it was out of that relationship that my my thoughts are, well, I'm not a historian, but it's my thought that's where the city of Oakland come out of. So it's historically